All right now, one more time I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Uh, I am Brother James. It is my honor and privilege to serve as the pastor of the Bible Baptist Church in DeLand, Florida. I've been serving as pastor there since 1987. And we are studying together the Bible book of Revelation. We have made our way into chapter number four. We had John caught up alive from the earth into heaven in response to a call from the Lord to come up hither in connection with the sound of a, of a trumpet, at least that's what he heard, the sound that he heard was as a trumpet, and immediately he was taken from this earth to the third heaven and found himself round about the throne of God, and it just seemed like as good a time as any to begin a study on the Bible doctrine of the rapture. In our last lesson, we introduced that study and talked to you about why it is so important that we go over these matters and encouraged you to, to watch the full uh, unfolding of this teaching. And I'm very appreciative that you have uh, heeded that request and have joined us for this, our second lesson, which we are going to entitle simply The Doctrine of the Rapture or the, the Biblical Teaching on the rapture. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. That's John chapter 1 and verse 29. He came into the world to save sinners. That's 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 15. He died for all men according to 2 Corinthians 5 verses 14 and 15. He was buried and he rose again according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. The everlasting salvation of the soul is available to all who will call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, according to Romans 10 and verse number 13. I trust that you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior and that you know the forgiveness of sins through his precious blood. Colossians 1.14 says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So it's our purpose in this lesson to discuss the future of the physical body of the saved, born-again child of God. First, we will consider what happens to the redeemed who pass through the door of death. And second, we will see what the scripture promises to those who are alive at the time when Jesus comes for his church. We begin with John chapter 10. Let's go there. John chapter 10. And we'll read verses 17 and 18. John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. Jesus says, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. The Lord here shows himself to be more than a mere man. He claimed to possess a power belonging to no son of Adam. We often rejoice in Christ's power to rise from the dead, as we should. But there's another important consideration here. The Son of Man also stated his power to lay down his life. Roman soldiers didn't kill him. Jewish leaders did not take his life. Disease or injury did not overcome him. He didn't use a weapon or a device to kill himself. Jesus exercised his power as God to offer his life 
a voluntary sacrifice to the Father in payment for the sins of the world. Now, this is really important. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse number 8. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 8 is the cross-reference to John 10, 17, and 18. Here the Bible says, There is no man that hath power over the Spirit to retain the Spirit. Neither hath he power in the day of death. And there is no discharge in that war, neither shall wickedness deliver those that are given to it. When the time comes for our lives to be taken from us, we'll have no power to do anything about it. On the other hand, if, if the time has not come for our life to end, we will still be powerless. You say, well, no, I, I could end my life anytime I wanted to. Revelation 9, 6 uh, is the account of some who thought that way. And the Bible says in that verse, in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. That's an interesting passage. So we must agree that the power of death is greater than that power possessed by man. And yet... The Lord Jesus Christ proved himself to be greater than the power of death. So plainly, plainly, Jesus Christ was more than just a man. The Bible declares him to be God manifest in the flesh. Now look at Hebrews chapter 2. Let's go there. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse number 14. Hebrews chapter 2. And verse number 14, and watch what the scripture says here. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. Jesus Christ didn't begin in Bethlehem's manger Jesus Christ is the creator of the heavens and the earth, but he, he opted at a point in time to take part in flesh and blood. He became man. God was manifest in the flesh. Why did he do that? That through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. So the Lord Jesus Christ proved himself to be greater than sin. For the wages of sin is death, but he is alive forevermore. He proved himself to be greater than death. For in his resurrection he conquered death. He proved himself to be greater than the devil. For the devil had the power of death, but he couldn't hold Jesus Christ in the tomb. Three days and three nights after he laid down his life, the Lord took it up again and rose from the dead. So when we talk about our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, we are speaking of one who has the power to save from sin, from death, and from the devil himself. What a wonderful Redeemer. Those who have been saved have this promise from Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 5. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Now some are confused when reading these words, recalling that Jesus ascended into heaven, which would make it seem as though he had forsaken his disciples. But our doubts are cleared away when we turn to John chapter 16. Let's go there. John chapter 16, and we'll begin reading at verse number 5. John 16, verse 5. 
Here the Bible says, But now I go my way to him that sent me. And none of you asketh me whither goest thou, because I have said these things unto you. Sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Now we know, Scripture with Scripture, we know that the Comforter is the Holy Spirit. So having risen from the dead, the Son ascends to the Father and sends the Spirit from the Father to abide with the believer. And this is in perfect accord with that verse that we quote so often, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. The Holy Spirit comes to dwell in all believers, 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 and 13. And since the Son and the Spirit are one, the promise of God is maintained. Now, one reason for Jesus' ascension into heaven, and there were many, but for our study, one reason Jesus ascended into heaven is found in John 14, verses 1 through 6. Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also, and whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. This is, this is really a great truth, and I need to take the time here. Just, we'll, just, we'll just park our study just for a second. Thomas said, Jesus said, I'm going to leave the earth. I'm going to go to heaven. I'm going to, I'm going to depart this location and I'm going to go to be with my father and I'll get you there too. And Thomas said, I don't know the way to get there. And Jesus said, all you need to know is me. You don't, you don't need to find, uh, chart a course through the stars. You don't need to build a tower at Babel. You don't need to stack good deeds one on top of the other. Thomas, all you need to know is me. Why? I'll come get you. I will take you there. My friend, I'm not trying to get to heaven. I'm not working to go to heaven. I trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior, and he is going to take me to heaven. Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? That's all you need to be concerned about. He will take you to heaven. All right, so one of the things Jesus has done since ascending from the Mount of Olives while he's in the presence of the Father is, is preparing a place where those who trust him may dwell. Now, it must be evident to the thoughtful reader of the Bible, that if Jesus left this earth and went to heaven to make ready places for believers to dwell, that these saints are a separate company from earthly Israel, and that their destination is connected with their going to heaven, not with Jesus' return to the earth. He didn't say, I'll come back to the earth and prepare a place for you. That would have fit with all that we have learned about God's dealings with the nation of Israel from Genesis 12 through Malachi. But he said, no, no, I'm going to go prepare you a place in heaven and then I'll come and get you and take you to that place. This is a, 
This is a different group from the nation of Israel, and this is a different promise from all of those earthly promises of land grants and material prosperity and victory over warring armies and enemies round about. No, this is, this is departure to another place. We move now to Romans chapter 8. And in Romans 8.10, the Word of God says, let me, let me get there, Romans chapter 8 and verse number 10 and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. My body, though I'm saved, the Lord says, my body's still dead. I've got life on the inside it's surrounded by death on the outside. That's Romans 8.10. Look at Romans chapter 7. We'll see it again. Verse number 24. O wretched man that I am, who should deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the saved man or the saved woman has a living spirit that longs to be set free from its place of captivity. Look at 2 Corinthians 5. The truth is, is expanded there. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 1. 2 Corinthians 5, 1. For we know that if our earthly house... See, what I'm living in, of this tabernacle, temporary, not a temple, tabernacle, temporary, were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. I'm not going to be reincarnated. I'm going to leave life down here and begin to enjoy life up there. For in this body, house, tabernacle, we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. <laughs> you, you, you young people, you just wait. You just wait. You know what you do right now? You leap from the bed. You race out into the yard. You jump on the bicycle. You ride over to the friend's house. I, I, I understand. I understand. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. Ah, you in the prime of your life, I know what you do. You get out there and you work all day long and you come home and you, and you enjoy the evening time. I get it. I get it. You live long enough when you get up out of the chair to be something like this. And when you sit down in the chair, it'll be something like this. Oh, and when you turn over in the bed at night, it'll be, mm. this body this body has a very, very limited time frame. Oh, it's marvelous. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. In your youth, the wonderfully really stands out. In your old age, the fearfully tends to rise to the forefront. We groan in these bodies. Why? desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. What, look, what's, what is he saying? The me that lives inside this temporary home is going to move out one day and take up residence in a much nicer home. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality. Look, I'm saved, but I'm mortal. I have life right now in this body, but it is subject to death at any moment that this mortal might be swallowed up of life. Right now, my life is inside death. One day, my life will be inside life. It'll, it'll just be all life. Now, he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God. 
He didn't make us to die. He made us to live. Who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit inside you, the Holy Spirit inside me is the down payment. Oh, if the, if the down payment is this great, what does God have waiting for us? Therefore, we are always confident knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, as long as this body is my home, we are absent from the Lord. If we walk by faith, not by sight, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Okay, this is what I want you to see. This is what I want you to understand. We have a dwelling place now that was prepared by God in the womb of our mother, Psalm 139, it is subject to sickness, sorrow, pain, eventual death because of the sin that is in our members. When we trust the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, he forgives our sin, he saves our soul, he cleanses us from all unrighteousness, but all of that takes place while I am still living in this body that is full of sin and therefore subject to death. I trust we all see that from the Bible. Now, if you wanted to go to heaven right now, what would hinder you? The fact that you're in a body of death. Nothing corrupt can enter there. If corruptible flesh, this corruptible flesh were taken off of you, or if you were to be taken out of the body of death, you could be and you would be present with the Lord. He's gone to prepare a place for all believers. He said he would never leave us or forsake us. If if our souls were laid in the grave and left in the ground to rot with our bodies once physical death laid hold upon us, then the Lord's word would be violated. He would have indeed forsaken you, for he has no place in the grave. He's alive forevermore, remember? Revelation 1.18. If your soul were to enter hell, the promise of the Lord would be broken, for his soul was not left in hell, Acts 2.27. If you are in Christ and Christ is in you, I'm in Christ, Christ is in me, the two of you, the two of us, will dwell together for all eternity. And when we are absent from the body, we will indeed be present with the Lord. Let's move now to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, this is the most detailed passage in all the Word of God on the resurrection. And let's read here, uh, starting at verse number 35. 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 35. But some men will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Notice there's no, there is no statement that if you get saved, you will never die a physical death. That is, your body, your body will cease to function as the home or house for your soul. You will have to vacate these premises at some point in time. Thou fool, verse 36, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain, but God, hath given, God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him and every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh. And there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. Plain common sense. There are also, now this is not so plain because you can't see it. This is not so plain because you not yet experience. We know from experience 
that the flesh of men and the flesh of beasts are different. We know from experience the flesh of fish and the flesh of birds is different. We know that. We've, we've seen it, touched it, handled it, experienced, dined upon it. Well, not the, not the men part. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. That is, terrestrial pertaining to the earth, celestial pertaining to the heavens. That we've not seen. That we've not experienced. I know, I know a couple of you have, have encountered some celestial bodies out in the backyard on a, on a dark night, but we, we, can't, we can't deal with that uh, today. But the, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. So there's a body suited for this earth. It's not suited for heaven. There's a body suited for heaven. It's not designed for life on this earth. Not primarily anyway. There's one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for one star differeth from, from another star in glory. God, God didn't make everything the same. So also is the resurrection of the dead. Just like throwing seeds into the ground, it is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. The body you're in now, subject to decay. Little by little before death, quite rapid after death. But when that body is raised up by the power of God, it will never again be subject to death. Not while living and certainly there won't be a, a, another, another death. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Now, it's still a body. It's still a body. But it's not subject to the wreck and ruin of nature. It is subject to the glorious life of the Spirit of God. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. Physical first, spiritual second. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Oh, oh, we can't, we can't, we can't get sidetracked. He's going to make you like himself. In every way. Amazing. As we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. It's not in doubt. It's an absolute fact. It is the promise of God. You are going to be raised from the dead. You are going to be, be changed. And all this sin will be gone. All this death will be gone. Praise the Lord. Now, this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit in corruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. When we talk about the rapture, our belief is what, what we see in the Bible is that some people who know Jesus as their Savior go through the doors of death and their bodies are laid in the grave, but they them, themselves, the saved soul, is absent from that body and present with the Lord. And that other people will be alive and remain. And when the Lord comes, he's going to resurrect the bodies, reunite the body and the soul, and we're all caught up together, the, the, those who had been dead and those who are alive, be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. Now here, here's our first biblical look at that, that truth Verse 51 says, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Everyone who is saved 
is not going to die a physical death, but we shall all be changed. This, this transformation he's talking about from a temporary body to a deathless glorified body is going to happen to every believer. It will happen to some who have already died, but it will happen to some who have never tasted physical death. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible should have put on incorruption and this mortal should have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Now look, look. Some people are going to be delivered from the grave, but others are going to be delivered from death itself. There's the dead in Christ rising first, and we which are alive and remain being caught up together with. It's, it's right there. It's right there. The sting of death is sin, the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm, I'm going I'm to stop there for this lesson because we've we, we got to break this into, into segments somewhere, somehow. But here's what you've read with me today on this program. If you trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, he will save your soul. That does not deliver your body from the effects of sin, which eventually would drag it down into death. However, the Lord who died and was buried and rose again has gone to heaven to prepare a place for everyone who believes on him, and he has promised to come and receive them unto himself. Now, at some point in time, that work will be finished. At some point in time, the day of his return will come. And when that day happens, whatever day it is, and we would not be foolish enough to try and set a date, whatever day that is, there will be believers who have died whose bodies will be raised up from that sleep. And there will be believers who are alive who have not died. And together they will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. That's as far as we can go on this lesson. But I hope you believe the word of God. It is, it's exciting and helpful to believe what God wrote in his word. Would you do something for us? Just all it takes is just a little click on a button that says subscribe, and that will help you to help us get these sermons and Bible studies to people all around the world. Thank you for that. Appreciate you watching. Lord willing, we pick up right here next time. I'm Brother James. Until then, may the Lord richly bless you and good day.